Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Redman. I'm the curator of botany and also the interim vice president of uh, research and conservation here at the museum. And it is my honor to like welcome all of you to tonight's uh, presentation. We're thrilled to have you here. In fact, tonight we have one of our very own. Uh, our mammologist, uh, Scott Tremor, is going to be speaking about the role camera traps play in uh, wildlife management and uh, uh, conservation. This talk is an extension of our newest photo exhibition called Caught on Camera. And it is, in fact, that is going on right now upstairs. So if you have not got a chance to see that, please uh, uh, come back at another time and go see that new uh, exhibit that we have on camera. Uh, before we begin the program, um, I have a few reminders for everyone. Emergency exits, always a necessity. Uh, there are two in the back and up in the front here as well. And uh, please remember to turn off your cell phones. So right now, silence them if you could. But uh, don't let that stop you talking about uh, uh, tonight's uh, uh, presentation and all the natural history things you're going to learn on social media. And if you could, use hashtag NatTalk. Um, as an organization focused on preserving biodiversity in our region, it is important that the museum recognize and pay our respects to the indigenous peoples who are traditional stewards of the land. Specifically, we recognize the Kumeyaay people whose ancestral homelands the museum currently occupies. We extend our respect and gratitude to the indigenous people who have lived here and cared for this land since time immemorial. As the original caretakers and conservationists, we honor their continued legacy of understanding, caretaking, and upholding the pillars of biodiversity. In respect of the Nat Talks, we have a terrific lineup for you, not just tonight, but in the next few months. In March, we're hosting a virtual panel with scientists from both sides of the border, from the US and from Baja California, and that are basically working together to try and document um, the plant and animal diversity on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, it is, uh, the whole project is called the Border Bio Blitz, and it's a binational community science uh, effort taking place throughout April. So if you're into iNaturalist and the like, please go and join that project and help us document what's along the border on both sides, whether you're working in the uh, on the Baja California side or on the California side. Also in April, we are honored to host Dr. Jennifer Norris from the California Natural Resources Agency. And she'll be talking about the 30 by 30 initiative, which is focused on conserving 30% of California's land and water uh, by 2030. And that coincide that Nat talk that's going to be there is basically the keynote presentation uh, that caps off our state of biodiversity symposium. So just in case you don't have that on your calendars, it's the 12th of April coming up. And that will be the sales just went on. You could actually get your tickets right now if you'd like for that day event. Um, it's a great opportunity to network with peers and hear from diverse voices about regional conservation topics throughout our region. And then in May, we're hosting a talk about the history of Torrey Pines and our role in conserving it. Uh, this is a partnership with the La Jolla Historical Society uh, on the occasion of their newest e uh, exhibit, which is called Rare Trees and Sacred Canyons, Torrey Pines, San Diego Symbol of Preservation. And if that's not enough for you, don't forget that we have Nat at Night um, now on a monthly basis. So we've extended it kind of throughout the year. On the third Friday of every month, it will be open until 10 p.m. So you can come and enjoy the museum, the exhibition. I highly recommend going to uh, the rooftop and you can get some good views and some great vibes with what's going on uh, in the region. Plus admission is half price after 5 p.m. Um, and then I want to acknowledge our sponsors. The 22-23 uh, season of Nat Talks is made possible by our presenting sponsor, the Downing Family Foundation, 
and the media partner, KPBS, the public media station serving San Diego and Imperial County. So without further ado, let me introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Scott Tremar started here at the museum as a volunteer in 1990, um, while he was also working as keeper in the mammal uh, collection of the San Diego Zoo. In 2004, we stole him away, and he now <laughs> became a, a full-time uh, staff member here at the museum, and he has been here ever since. He has dedicated his career to observing and documenting mammals, especially rare rodents, in Southern California and the Baja California Peninsula uh, in an effort to uh, bring further awareness to the biodiversity and conservation of species that occur in our region. More currently, he is investigating the biology of a previously thought to be extinct San Quentin kangaroo rat and is also investigating several uh, poorly studied species, including the ringtail and the San Bernardino a flying squirrel, which probably a little of that is in tonight's talk, I would assume. He is also the, the principal editor of the San Diego County Mammal Atlas. His local experience and his relationships with experts in our region have uh, helped bring this book to completion. And I want to remind all of you, after this talk, please go up to the, the bookstore, to our, our gift store, and he's going to be signing copies of the Mammal Atlas. And we'll kind of remind you of that as well. So I won't talk anymore, but let's get Scott up here and get started. <laughs> well, thanks, John. Um, welcome, everyone, to uh, the Wildlife Candy Camera Show. Uh, tonight, <laughs> my job is to entertain you for about an hour so with some wonderful photos and uh, hopefully some great science that goes along with it. So um, give me a little time here, but um, each photo is going to have a story. And I'm going to ask a lot of you during this talk to tell me the story uh, because uh, it's just a caption and it's just a short period of time when all these photos are taken and there's always something happening and we can always interpret them a little bit different. So um, this talk was hard to pull together because as you can imagine, we have thousands and thousands and tens of thousands uh, of photos to choose from and it was really hard for me to pull this one together. So a lot has been omitted. I have about 100 slides to go through. Um, one of the things that's omitted very uh, quickly and forgive me for all the botanists that are here um, because when we do uh, uh, motion camera work, when we do motion camera work, um, one of the worst things that happens is if you aim your camera at a plant and it's windy and 98% of your photos are going to be moving plants. I, a lot of the people here that are scientists that have mu used uh, motion cameras, this, you learn to, to set up your camera so it, it's away from plants. So forgive me, this is going to be a mammal rich talk and uh, sorry, John. <laughs> um, so let's, let's get started. Um, I'm going to first talk very quickly. There's some organization that you'll, you'll see in a few slides, but right away we have two different types of media. We have both video, and this is a badger uh, that was recently captured on uh, camera um, out in uh, the Warner Valley area. And badger are very, very rare. Uh, we have some folks here from USGS who are doing some great work with badger. Uh, up in the corner up there so we can answer more questions maybe after. Um, but they were doing very, very poorly in San Diego County for a very long time. And not until recently did we start seeing really good sign of them coming back. And uh, Devin, I don't know if you could uh, throw some information in here if it's the, if it's the rodenticides or not, but uh, uh, they seem to be, the population seems to be rebounding and we're getting a lot more sightings. So Devin up there is, in charge of a, a really good database with them. But, um, and then this same camera, the following day, uh, is this ground squirrel, a very lucky ground squirrel. So for those of you who know anything about badger, they love to eat ground squirrel. <laughs> and this uh, ground squirrel is probably very confused uh, and how it survived, but uh, again, that is the same burrow, and the badger could be in that burrow, I don't know. It might not be the wisest or smartest of, uh, 
ground squirrels. But uh, um, so that's the two type of media you're really going to see tonight. Um, let's get into what currently motion cameras are being used for. Um, I have a ring camera now, and it's uh, captured some really interesting photos. But uh, you, you often have some very welcome guests with a ring camera, if, uh, those of you who have them. Um, And then unwelcome guy. Creepy guess. <laughs> and cute. Of course, I had to put a cute one in. Um, this reminds me how, how, uh, how they first started the Godzilla movies, you know. <laughs> it's a praying mantis if you can't see it. And then this might be some cool to some people, but maybe not so to others. Uh, lion are often clowned. The next one, I'm really excited about this one. This, there's multiple photos of this black bear. And uh, this is some type of learned behavior that this bear, uh, perhaps a bit narcissistic, um, continued to push the, pic the, the camera. Because if you have a ring camera, it kind of flashes and makes a little noise. But this bear continued to take photos of itself. Uh, or expecting a treat in, in, in return, I don't know. Uh, but following that, there's this fox squirrel. Some guy trained a fox squirrel to push the ring camera. And then every time it, it did it, it was fed a Fig Newton. I suspect that, that fox squirrel is pretty heavy by now. <laughs> Presently, I'm only allowed two Fig Newton tonight, and uh, I'm sure he's had many more. Um, okay. So I started motion camera work back in the 90s. Uh, my first project I did it at was uh, uh, State Route 52 when Santo Road ended at, I'm sorry, when the, the freeway ended at Santo Road. And there's all these canyons that come down out of Mission Trails, uh, Shepherd's Canyon, Oak Canyon, Spring Canyon. And we wanted, and there, there was proposed uh, highway overpasses to, to continue moving that all the way down to Santee, which it is now. And so we wanted to see where most of the wildlife was moving through. And in, in the end, we identified three major canyons. And they put bridges over two and a wildlife tunnel in one. But we use these old school methods. And for those of you who are old enough to remember uh, um, film cameras, um, this was actually a setup that we used. It was a Trailmaster 500, I remember. And it had a sender and receiver. Because remember like when you walked into 7-Eleven and it, little doorbell ding would go off. It was the same, same concept, and then, but that would trigger a camera and a flash. So it was the old school flash, and it used to scare the daylights out of every animal that uh, uh, you would take a photo of. But uh, um, really cool system, and that was the infancy of it, really. And then it slowly transitioned into uh, the motion cameras that we have today. So uh, yeah, fast forward, this is the 2020 version of... Uh, uh, motion camera, and it's probably like 10, 15 megapixels with a three-quarter second delay. They're pretty cool stuff now, um, and they're very, very effective. And we'll talk more about the positives and negatives of these, but these have infrared flashes, and so it's a lot, lot more friendly to wildlife. I prefer not to use the regular old-school flashes because although they take wonderful photos, uh, they do scare the daylights out of animals. Um, you usually just get one good shot, and it's gone. And it's, it's probably a little bit of harassment. So these infrareds are the, really the way to go. And at the end of this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit how to set them up and some of the positives and negatives about doing it in certain ways so everybody has a, a good image on how to move forward with theirs. But tonight I've got this uh, um, talk organized in four categories. Uh, wildlife movement, inventories, which we do a lot of, distribution, as well as behavior. So. Let's jump into Bowdoin Canyon Ecological Reserve. Has anybody been there yet? I know many of you have. How's it feel right now? That's good. Because if you've never been to Bowdoin Canyon, it's a really, really great hike. Um, it's right off of uh, Highway 78 in between the Wild Animal Park and Ramona. There's not much parking. Do it on a weekday. It's a beautiful hike through oak woodlands. Um, there's a, a series of properties. It's surrounded by many properties. We'll get to that in a second. Um, 
but we were contracted by the state of California Department of Cal California Department of Fish and Wildlife to do a uh, not only an inventory of mammals that are there, but um, uh, a corridor survey to just see the value if it is a valuable uh, wildlife corridor and to document the movement of animals that are in it. And so this is a, a, a blow up of the of the properties, but at the bottom end down here, let's see if I can make the pointer work. This is Santa Isabel Creek, which runs along Highway 78, as well as the creek that runs north-south, uh, all the way up to uh, Rancho Guajita. And if everybody's ever seen or heard of Rancho Guajita, it's a beautiful ranch. It's just this enormous, large uh, span of oak woodland that uh, still is pretty, pretty in good, in pretty good shape. And so there's a lot of movement that happens between the north and the south on this corridor. Um, and so here's some of the land ownership surrounding it. Um, again, right out there in the middle, uh, you could see that there's um, federal lands, U.S. Fish, uh, that's U.S. Forest Service. City owns a bunch of, the city of San Diego owns a bunch of land around it. It's just, it's just a really cool place and a really, really important uh, um, movement corridor. And so this is some of the connectivity monitoring is from the connectivity monitoring and strategic plan as well as the MSCP and connecting the corridors. Uh, and you could see uh, the value of where it sits in all of these identified wildlife corridors adjacent to it. And you could see Ramona is right here as well as Escondido right there. Okay, let's go into some of these fun photos. We got our first, first fun guy is a striped skunk. Everybody's seen them. We're all here in the city. Uh, when they raise that tail, it's something you've got to you've got to be careful. So a lot of these photos you're going to see tonight are animals reacting. Even these new motion cameras, um, they make noise. I don't hear it, um, but they hear it. All the animals are here. You'll see every single, almost every single animal reacting to these cameras. So. Um, not sure what, what his concern is. Anybody got an idea of what this gray fox is thinking? <laughs> no? No? Yeah. He's probably feeling a little bit trapped. It's a little tight in there, and he's, uh, he's heard the camera. He, uh, he's probably a little bit spooked. So you're going to see a lot of cool behaviors in a little bit. Okay. Does everybody see it? Any idea what it is? It's a pretty s monster, yeah. Scary. Um, I've got a blown up photo of him. He's more scared than we should be. That's an opossum. So they're introduced to San Diego County and they're really starting to spread all over. It's really quite amazing and they're really starting to um, persist in more natural habitat where before um, they were really just urban adapters more closely tied to the city. So now they're you can find them way out in Julian and in, in, the, in the far back country and somehow they're surviving, which is not good. So any invasive species that's in San Diego County usually is displacing something somehow or another. And so it's, it's always a concern. So this animal is not from San Diego County. It was introduced back at the early 1900s. Uh, there was a radiation from the ports of Los Angeles and San Francisco. And they're, they're here now, they're here to stay. We're never gonna get rid of them. Um, they're really, they're really interesting animals, but they shouldn't be here. Oh, here's a good one. So this also is in Bowdoin Canyon. So what's going on here? Does anybody know what it is? Yeah, Western Gray Squirrel. Very, 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 very important animal because they used to be, uh, and I highly recommend the Mammal Atlas because we cover this animal really, really well. It's likely going to be of conservation concern down here at some point in time. Um, but uh, very rarely do you see them on the ground unless they're foraging, you know, scratching through the dirt where they, where they uh, uh, stored some food um, or are looking for some stored food. But uh, uh, they're normally in the trees. Um, they're often not easy to see. Uh, really early in the morning, you can hear them calling, and they're a lot more visible. But during the middle of the day, they're rarely seen. But the gray squirrel was once really, really common down into the lowlands, down into El Cajon Valley down into uh, Escondido, uh, and probably data that we don't know, um, maybe even closer to the coast. So this animal um, now is of concern because um, number one, uh, range, it was, uh, I'm sorry, mange, it was, it's been retracting because populations are dying off of, of mange is one of its biggest issues. 
um, as well as um, they're very susceptible to uh, road mortality. So if you've ever seen a squirrel, it, it's very indecisive in the road. It wants to go one way and then another and then back another, and then they often get squished. Um, really, really common. But um, the big, one of the newest threats is the fox squirrel. So for those of you who know that really cool squirrel that we see here, we used to see here in Balboa Park, is now, um, it used to, up until about 2008, 2009, just live in Balboa Park. Something happened. We don't know what happened, but then suddenly it had just exploded, and now it's all throughout the city. Um, it's all the way up into Julian. So this is a known competitor of, uh, the fox squirrel is a known competitor with the gray squirrel. They look really similar. They're just, fox squirrel is just more reddish on the breast. Um, and uh, they, they are known to outcompete the gray squirrel. So this is an animal, uh, this animal is a, uh, one we really need to watch out for in Southern California. Okay, you guys recognize that one. Yeah, they're really cool. Long-tailed weasels. So when I started here at the museum back in the 90s, um, everybody was saying, these, these animals are rare. We've got to put them on some type of list. Uh, we've we've got to do something about them. Um, and then, you know, I, like a good scientist, I said, where's, where's the proof? And uh, there, <laughs> there was none other than people's gestalt. And so um, I put the word out to start people to start bringing in the, the ones that they find. And so that would be roadkill, because these also are, do the same thing. They go back and forth on the road. Uh, and then suddenly, I've been overrun with uh, roadkill, long-tailed weasels for the last 30 years that we have so many, I don't know what to do. At this, we're, we're starting to turn them away now. There's so many. But so uh, these animals are just very stealthy. You don't see them very often. And when you do, it's a treat. I've only seen two or three in my career. And they're really just neat animals. OK. Yep, so we're starting to see some of the photos where the animals are, are actually looking at the camera. So just the southern mule deal. This is all that, that's the same camera uh, site for all of those. Um, so we littered that canyon with motion cameras. And so from the northern end to the southern end and uh, watched animals as they moved from north to south. You could tell individuals by uh, a lot of the photos. And so it was really interesting to see uh, how quickly a lot of these animals moved up and down. It's still a safe place to hide, I'm sure. <laughs> um, this is a mother and three young um, mountain lion that uh, were moving down a canyon. Um, and we, again, got them at the north end and the south end, you know, within the same evening. Uh, really beautiful animal. And a nice big male. So we documented what we believe are six animals in that, in just in that canyon. So there's a lot of overlapping territories. Um, but some really, really, really cool stuff. So that's, uh, um, and I never saw any, but we did see some good tracks up in there. Okay, so we're still in wildlife movement. Let's go now to the ringtail uh, space use project. So if anybody knows what a ringtail is, it's a, uh, it's in the relative, uh, it's a relative of the, the raccoon, so it's in the family Procyonidae. Uh, really, really cool animals, very, very different than a, a raccoon. Um, much smaller, much more agile. Their hind, hind legs, hind feet, they can turn 180 degrees so they can climb straight up a vertical surface and can climb straight down a vertical surface. They're very, very agile. They're, they're amazing animals, and the vertical surfaces is what they need. That is their uh, escape mechanism for a lot of uh, uh, predators, and the, the predators are many from owls to foxes to coyotes to lions, to everything like that. So they're, um, they're really, really cool animals. And so we've been picking up a lot of roadkill uh, over the years from Mount Woodson. And, um, and so this is starting to be a concern because this, this animal is a fully protected species in the state of California. What that means, Melissa, you tell me. I don't know if it's, uh, if it's, uh, <laughs> if what's that? Oh, you're not working. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's a, it, you would think it's a step above uh, uh, endangered, but it really isn't. It, it has a different status, and I, I'm really honestly not sure. But it's, uh, we really know very little about it. So there's a group of uh, biologists who have been doing a lot of work in the Central Valley uh, for 20, 30 years, but nobody's really doing anything in Southern California. So we, uh, we being the researchers from the San Diego Zoo, 
and myself uh, started on this project um, probably five, six years ago now. So we have some folks here. Uh, JP is here from the zoo, and Dave's here too. Awesome. Um, and then there's another Dave from the Forest Service side uh, that that are involved with this project. It's a really, really fun project. It's it's new to a lot of us, and so. Uh, at Mount Woodson, the concern is, I think my next slide, where did, no, no, I don't have the next slide from Mount Woodson. Um, uh, it's right next to Highway 67 is where they're really getting hammered. And so uh, we took on Mount Woodson and uh, JP and I started setting motion cameras for a year, maybe two prior to uh, actually live trapping the animals. and. Uh, learned a lot, it took a while to figure out how to actually bait them and where to set the cameras, how to set the cameras. It was a lot of um, uh, uh, trial and error and we finally got it figured out and uh, JP's the king at it now. And uh, Dave's great at uh, setting the bait, that's one of his, <laughs> his claims to fame. But um, it, uh, w we, we have documented many uh, on this mountain, and so here's setting a motion camera. This is up in the Forest Service land. Um, that's, I think that's Dave. <laughs> um, but again, the vertical surfaces uh, are super, super important with these animals. And there's a certain bait, there's a certain brand of strawberry jam that you're supposed to use, but there's another big concoction that's really effective, and I don't need to go into all of that. Uh, but how you do it and where you do it is super, super important. And um, Eventually, uh, we were able to document enough so that we felt confident we could start um, live trapping. Oh, sorry. Um, and again, looking for vertical surfaces. Um, this is up in Forest Service lands. Oh, I don't know why you guys are here, but the turkey vultures were uh, messing with the traps in one of the locations. But we ended up catching some. And uh, we were able to... Uh, uh, You'd pull them out of a trap, and they would all go down to uh, the veterinarian uh, from the San Diego uh, Wild Animal Park. They, they and, and JP affixed the uh, GPS collars and um, uh, released them back into the wild, and there they would run around for six to eight weeks with a collar and present some really cool data. <laughs> so this is kind of messy, and I went over this with JP just to make sure I'm right. There's three animals here. Three animals here. Um, that's a male. That other green one is a male. And then this is a female overlapping bull. But see how interesting it is that they're avoiding Highway 67. There's water down here. There's no water sources up here. So they're uh, really getting all of their water just from their food sources. So, and also probably there's a little bit of fear that um, they know that uh, they might get squished crossing that road. We do have some data from other animals crossing, so they are going to disperse, especially when they have young. That's, that's a tight area for uh, X amount of animals, so sooner or later they gotta move. So back over in here is Iron Mountain, and so I think we're gonna start up again this year, uh, um, setting motion cameras soon, and then maybe trapping again this year and, and starting this all go over again, but simultaneously running uh, U.S. Forest Service land. So the U.S. Forest Service land is our control. So this is our experimental site where we have the, the, the highway, the roadways next door, and then we have a nice, big, wide open space. And so we're going to see if these home ranges that we're seeing here are going to be similar to a, a natural one. So uh, it's a really co cool study. It's completely unfunded. If anybody has ideas on where to find funds, this is super important because we really want to move forward with this project. There we go. All right, a fun project that uh, Phil Unit, Lori Hargrove, uh, and myself uh, started ooh, back in, oh, no, 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 too far. I didn't do that. Uh, 2008 was the San Jacinto Centennial Resurvey. So this is another inventory. Uh, oh, this is the first of the inventory ones. So this is the type of work I really like doing as well. So we tr you go out and you set bait. So we talked about the bait for the ringtail but now you're trying to set bait for everybody. And so it's a huge concoction of everything and um, uh, you never know what you're gonna get. It's just like, it's like fishing. Sometimes you have no idea what's gonna come up. 
But Joseph Grinnell was uh, 1908, a, uh, as Phil likes to say, a newly minted PhD. His first expedition, so he worked for the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at Berkeley. He was the first curator there. And his first uh, project was to go to the San Jacinto Mountains. And for those of you who don't know where the San Jacinto Mountains are, this is Palm Springs, uh, Salton Sea down here in Hemet area, um, Interstate 10. So it's that big mountain range, and Anza Beret goes down in, uh, down in this area. So it's that big mountain range. And so he worked that site. He had 20 campsites, and over four months, he and several young men um, uh, trapped, collected all over this mountain range, birds, mammals, and some herps. So there's 20 campsites that range from uh, zero feet elevation all the way up to 11, uh, 10,000 feet. Uh, doing some really, really cool work. And so we decided in 2008, 100 years later, to start uh, to resurvey this site as well. And so this is a big group of surveys that the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology is running. They're doing uh, many sites in California, like Yosemite, Lassen. Um, and so we took on the first of those. Lots of cool photos from there. So this raccoon has no care in the world for this camera. I'm sure he heard it. And uh, uh, raccoons usually have that, uh, that kind of an attitude. They don't have a lot of fear of things. Um, and there's jackrabbits. So look at the time stamp on these, 5.42 a.m. To me, it looks like it's low light situations, but that jackrabbit's really exposed right now. So yeah, he, he might have to worry about a predator being around, like this guy. So this is a nice big mountain lion. Look at this mule deer. Anybody got a story on him? Yeah, there's a, there's a big gash. There's a few gashes. Could they be lying? I don't know. Could it be just cruising through the brush? I don't know. Does not look too spooked. So, um, oh yeah, this one was over by Lake Hemet, so it might be around a lot of people, and it's just probably not that dirty where it walked in. And every now and then we capture pictures of biologists walking by as well. That's our very own Phil unit. Uh, you can see the, with his binoculars and hopefully enough water uh, out. And I think this is Little Paradise, a really super remote area, one site that we take all our equipment in by mules. It was a really cool, a really, really beautiful site. Um, we spent a lot of time there. So these 20 campsites, I should have told you, we spent, um, we visited each campsite three times and each survey was a week long. So. It was uh, 60, if you do the math, it's 60, but I think in the end we did 65 because we had to repeat some others. 65 full weeks on this project and it was a really, really, really cool project. We're finally writing up those results now and hope to have those out sooner than later. And just the token herp, uh, it's funny granite lizard. <laughs> um, and more ringtail. So this is when I was first starting to learn uh, where and how to bait for them. and. Uh, uh, that was down in Palm Canyon, down uh, really on the low desert end. Okay, this coyote. Yeah, it's just a coyote, but it's a majestic looking coyote. So, tell me the story. Who's got a good one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to me, I think he's strutting a little bit. He's posing. I, I get that. Uh, that's what I see in it. Anybody else? No, go ahead. Oh, oh, yeah, me. Oh, I didn't see that. Or up here? Oh, wow. Ooh, that's good. See? Anything else? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I would. St yeah, so this is uh, November, so that makes sense. I think, I can't remember where this one came from. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Could have been a bath, yeah. All right, those are some good some some good eyes. But um, again, every photo tells an interesting story. And yeah, here's another good one. The gray foxes. You've all seen gray foxes. They live here in the city. They do very very well in the urban canyons. 
I don't, as well as the coyotes. But there's a really interesting partition that happens with coyotes and gray foxes. Um, uh, the foxes leave when the coyotes come in. So when, when uh, coyotes are absent from a canyon and they find their way back in, and the foxes that are, were there prior, uh, the foxes will move out or will move to the edges. They're, they're very, very strong at partitioning their, uh, um, uh, where they live. And so the foxes uh, um, generally don't do well around the coyote. Everybody knows that this is a chipmunk. This was one of our focus uh, uh, animals on this project is um, the uh, lodgepole. This next one, sorry. The lodgepole chipmunk um, used to live up on the highest elevations of San Jacinto Mountain. And it, um, uh, it was it, during Grinnell's first surveys, he documented many. And then uh, when we showed up in 2008, there were none. Uh, all we found were um, uh, the chaparral chipmunk and the Miriam's chipmunk. And so for some reason, this higher elevation species blinked out. And so that, you know, we have to start thinking about what are some of those reasons. And uh, um, we're working on a paper right now that's addressing a little bit of that. Uh, but also in the higher elevations were uh, the flying squirrel. And Joseph Grinnell in 1908 uh, wrote from Idlewild, Nearly every night we have heard the chuckling of Sirophterus in the trees around where we sleep, outdoors, under black oak. So um, flying squirrels were there. Um, they're not anymore. So another uh, squirrel species that's missing. So I'm going to come back to that animal in a little bit, but let's move on to the next one. So um, that San Jacinto Centennial Resurvey uh, moved on to another project where we did a resurvey of the Mojave uh, National Preserve and Joshua Tree. This was funded by NSF. And um, uh, Mojave uh, being up here, Joshua Tree down here. Um, lots of, so we had 30, 30 sites that we worked for this project um, over, I think, three years. Uh, it was mostly mammals, uh, uh, a, lo a lot of bird work as well, uh, but it was more mammal, uh, mammal work. And so, but uh, every now and then we get some really cool uh, diurnal photos of some birds, and I had to throw in the roadrunner. Um, and again, the animals are just staring right. So 36 degrees in September, that's pretty cold. So this is probably a, high, uh, a high ele higher elevation. And we get the domestics and more mountain lions. Some beautiful funny so, uh, bunnies. So look at the, the coat on this rabbit. So this one is May, so it's coming out of its winter coat. You can see it's kind of uh, molting here, uh, but still a beautiful animal. I think I see a bunch of ticks in its ears, which are pretty normal. This is Audubon's cottontail, the super common cottontail that we all see here in San Diego. Uh, but uh, I just had to throw in that nice photo. Spotted skunk. Really cool animal. JP can tell tons of stories about spotted skunks, but uh, um, it's it's an animal that um, its niche is very similar to the wingtip. And so we often at Mount Woodson, JP would catch them often. And there's a certain trick about how not to get sprayed, because if you have an animal in a trap, it's really, really easy to get sprayed if you're not careful. Um, and JP can tell you those stories later. Um, but uh, the spotted skunk is uh, very, very arboreal. Uh, they do come down to the ground. We'll talk a little bit more about him a little bit later as well. Gray fox. And if you can't recognize there's a trap in the background, there's a little kangaroo rat in there. And so the kangaroo rat's eyes are probably huge at this point in time. Foxes are really, really curious about um, any trapping that we do, whether there be an animal in it or not. Um, in some places, I'll have 100 traps out a night, and 90 of them have been urinated on. I don't know. I don't know why. Wayne, do, can you give me a, <laughs> why would it be marking every single trap? I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know what the, the ownership is, but... Uh, um, yeah, and sometimes they grab one, which is a sad thing. But um, yeah, this this fox was just checking out the kangaroo rat. 
I found him the next morning alive and well. Um, and an antelope ground squirrel. Tell me a story here. I, I didn't even notice it now until I just looked at this photo. Yep, pregnant. Yeah, she's, she's, she's big. Or it's just somebody who's been fed too much. But I, looking at from where we are here, it looks like it's, a, it's quite remote. So um, yeah, it looks, looks really, really pregnant. Another good badger, folks. Badger are very, very curious. And again, this is another animal that's really, really getting hammered from uh, um, uh, crossing roads. Uh, badger have fear of nothing. And so uh, if an 18-wheeler is barreling down on it, um, they get squished, unfortunately. And so um, uh, we're looking at ways uh, uh, eventually someday to uh, – uh, make wildlife crossings at roadways for a lot of wildlife, and badger being one of them. So this is uh, one of the papers that we got out of the, um, uh, in science, uh, out of the uh, Joshua Tree in Mojave National Preserve. I'm going to keep moving. Now we're in the flying squirrels. This is, uh, this is a distribution study that we did. Um, we first learned that you heard earlier in the San Jacinto Centennial Resurvey. Still got 17 minutes, I gotta move fast. Um, so uh, we learned that those animals blinked out of the San Jacintos and I started asking myself, okay, did I survey for them correct? It was a, so it was a general inventory at San Jacinto. So I was trying to capture everything that I possibly could and make sure I had a census and, and knew that everything that was there. We never found the flying squirrel. We interviewed a ton of people. Nobody had seen any since the 1990s. And so, um, and even then they were rare. So um, I went to the San Bernardino Mountains where we knew that they were more common and we started to work on our methods uh, for um, detection. And um, once we finally perfected it, uh, we said, okay, we only have X dollars to do this project to find out where they are in the San Bernardinos. And so uh, we went to the public and said, we need your help. And so we enlisted oodles of citizen scientists uh, just by putting up this wanted posters at grocery stores, schools, et cetera. And uh, by calling on, on these, people would call us up and say, I want to be a part of this study. And so we would uh, uh, show up at some civic center in Big Bear or Lake Arrowhead and uh, would talk about the project and get everybody jazzed and excited. There was a lot of families that, that came. And... Um, we would send them home with a box, a box that had a motion camera in it, uh, uh, bait, a ton of bait, and some instructions, and sent them back and said, uh, give these back uh, to us in two months, uh, as well as your data. And just like the, uh, um, the plants, we got thousands and thousands and thousands of photos of anything and everything from bears <laughs> to, <laughs> to <laughs> raccoons. Uh, to gray squirrels, uh, because that bait stayed up. It didn't come in uh, during the day. It stayed up all day to uh, some fun birds, to lots of flying squirrels, which is really good. And so our method was super effective, and it was super simple. We tried many others. We tried hair snares and many other things. It just, it just wasn't as effective as just a, a basic motion camera with a good bait system. Um, and so we just kept getting photos and photos. And as a result, in all the yellow points, we were able to uh, increase the locations and increase its, its range a bit. And uh, we're still working on this project. Uh, our latest proposal now is, um, uh, so, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, we, took, we took those methods back. Uh, we, got w we have one, one publication out of it, three posters at scientific conferences and um, we have another paper on its way, and we have a proposal out right now because we took those methods back to the San Jacinto Mountains and employed them, and we got nothing. Zero, zero captures. We even added um, using bat detectors because you can, you can detect them with their ultrasonic frequencies. Uh, bat biologists have been picking it up. So we tried everything, um, and we tested those, those methods as well in the San Bernardinos. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't find them in the San Jacinto. So uh, we believe that they're extirpated there. 
<clears throat> and so um, we're wondering why. And so there's a two degree temperature difference uh, over those um, 100 years since uh, uh, Joseph Grinnell was still there. Uh, we're starting to think now it might be um, uh, the subterranean fungus, um, uh, the hypogeus fungi that they are known to consume and also distribute, which is all a part of forest health. And so even the chipmunks use those as well. So we have two animals that have, uh, we think are blanked out from that, uh, that mountain range. And in addition to that um, is, the, um, uh, is the spotted owl that is also blanked out. And the spotted owls eat flying squirrel. And so there's something interesting going on there and we're trying to find out. And so we have a proposal we hope to get funded soon uh, to, to at least try one of our guesses. And it, it, it could be something completely else, we don't know. Okay, feral pigs. Everybody remembers these. Uh, so back in about, two, it's happened a couple times. There was a couple uh, iterations of this. Somebody tried to introduce feral pigs to, to San Diego in the 90s. And then and again in 2006, but in 2006, the the um, the translocation stuck. So some guy was trying to uh, set up in the San Diego River a hunting hunting program of feral pigs, and so he brought in you know 30, 40 animals. And um, if you know pigs, they reproduce very, very quickly, and they're very, very destructive. And in a county that has so many reserve lands, endangered species, uh, habitats that are highly fragile. Uh, like this. This is in the San Diego River. This is some cattails that in one night just got ripped out. Oak woodlands, uh, so pigs will root through these oak woodlands and just tear them up completely, looking for acorns and, and really being destructive. Um, I'm going to move through these next photos pretty quick. So this is 2009. Um, these were some of the early surveys that we did via motion camera as well as sign uh, sign, uh, uh, we went out and looked for signs, so track and feces and such, but the motion cameras were uh, used quite extensively. And if you all can see where we are, we're in the San Diego River and that's El Capitan Reservoir, Lakeside, El Cajon. But very quickly did they spread uh, the next year, the next year, the next year, all the way up to 2013. And at about this point in time, so about 2010, um, there's some government, all the government agencies, everybody who was affected got together and uh, convened a meeting. And it was really difficult to get everybody on the same uh, game plan, but eventually it, it happened. And, um, and some control measures started to take place. I don't have this being reduced because the points still were very widespread, but um, you should know that uh, the last feral pig that we know was removed in 2020. El Capo was his name. Um, but he, he, he hid from everybody for a long time. Uh, but all the other ones were removed. Uh, and it was into the thousands, many thousands with the reproduction uh, that they're capable of. So um, uh, a program that uh, many of us are, are proud of that was really effective. Uh, but the, uh, the motion cameras produced a lot of really good photos. Um, the sad thing is, is this last year, I'm not sure how effective these guys are going to be, but somebody <laughs> released like a couple hundred pot-bellied pigs out in the Santa Isabel uh, area. And uh, I'm not up to date on what's going on with that. I think they were like pets. I think they were mostly rounded up pretty quickly and brought back in. Um, okay. So now we're getting to some behavior. So we're back on the ringtail project, and this is some of the photos Dave from the Forest Service here uh, sees. Um, we could see a ringtail and a spotted skunk there. And there is water right here in front of us, and I think there's more water trough. This is definitely late at night sometime, yeah, two in the morning. Um, and here we are with uh, uh, facing each other off, a ringtail and spotted skunk. So Sometimes these cameras, you, you're, you're capturing behavior, you're not necessarily looking for it, it, it just, you find it on a camera, and there's, there's a lot of cool stories that could be told here. Um, but here, let's watch this video. So that's w another motion camera taking a photo. And oh, interesting. 
The gray fox is a known predator of rainfish. So here they are. So again, there's water over here. Yeah, that looks like uh, a, uh, a Pinacate uh, Tunisianid, uh, a beetle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think he's interested in those. A stink bug. Yeah. I'm not sure they taste well. Um, but yeah, he's eating something else he's found. But um, here we have three ringtail at the same. So this is, uh, uh, Dave, is this? Mother and young, and then the male? Yeah, okay. So, oh yeah, there's the mother and young, and then a, a, an adult male as well. It's some just some interesting foraging behavior to watch. Let's keep moving because we don't have a lot of time. Okay, um, this is really interesting. So, striped skunk and a gray fox at the same watering hole. So, this... Um, I'm not sure it's been noted uh, before. I, I haven't done enough uh, looking into, but also look at this one. Gray foxes are also known predators of ringtail. So could this be truce at the waterhole? Have you ever heard of this? Um, so lions in, in, in Africa often do not kill the antelope at the same watering hole because you know, the more antelope they kill at the watering hole, the antelope won't come to the watering hole, and all the antelope will die off. And so they know not to consume them. Now, is that something that's going on here? I don't know. I don't know, but it's interesting. Uh, some other behavior. This is from WRI of an o uh, a golden eagle, um, a golden eagle nest out near Pala. You can see uh, um, an adult uh, incubating some eggs here. And then some hatchlings, some really cool hatchlings. So these cameras are, are really getting better, and they're really picking up some really, really cool photos. And then I had this one. This, this photo is probably 12, 13 years old. I'm not sure if you could see it. Yeah. This is completely, completely uh, uh, was not planning on it. I didn't have a, a, a ground squirrel there as bait. Um, it, it just happened right in front of the camera. This was... Uh, Barnett Ranch out of Ramona, where uh, a golden eagle just caught a ground squirrel right in front of the, the trail I put the uh, uh, camera on. It was really quite amazing. And this is new. Uh, if you haven't seen this in the news lately, this is um, a bald eagle nest out at Big Bear. And can you see a surprise up in the corner up here? You know what it is? It's another flying squirrel. And so get online and check this out. It's just like a big bear bald eagle cam. Um, but this flying squirrel, I'm not sure if all flying squirrels do it, but it jumps around in this nest and really upsets this bald eagle. There, there's something going on in that nest that it wants. I don't know what it is. Um, yeah, yeah, could be. Could be the egg. Um, it, yeah, maybe it's going after whatever she's uh, uh, sitting on, but uh, uh, it really upsets the eagle. So I don't have the video working on that one. So some more behaviors, uh, mate selection, as you can see the male wild turkey and the female right here. He's doing his song and dance. And then uh, deer um, uh, uh, working on a dominance. Uh, who's the dominant male for the area fighting for the right to mate with the female. Okay, um, so this is a grave vireo study I'm going to just leave this on for a little bit, and I'm going to try to explain this quickly because I've only got about four or five minutes. Uh, but this is a study that uh, Lori Hargrove and Phil Unit here, the ornithologists, uh, were working in um, eastern San Diego County. They first learned that the grave vireo may be declining during the San Jacinto uh, survey. Do you see that? I know it's really pixelated, sorry. But use your imagination, and while I work on this, you guys try to figure out what it is. But the gray vireo uh, was really in decline, uh, found uh, to be in decline in the San Jacinto survey, resurveys. And so they set out to uh, look throughout its range what might be causing it. And it was uh, nest failures. Um, uh, oh, wow, that was pretty big. Um, and so what we ended up doing is building these nest traps. So with these long um, 
cables that were hooked up to a battery somewhere way far away, and this camera would be uh, positioned on a nest, and there it would sit for uh, a couple days until the battery ran out, and, uh, and then somebody would have to watch that long video and figure out what might be happening. Uh, but that was a predation by a bobcat, if, it, if you guys couldn't figure that out. Um, so uh, I think it slowed down maybe right here. Yeah, there's the foot. It's really fuzzy to me where I am, but uh, let's move. And then uh, one, of the, one of the bigger issues were scrub jays. I'm not sure if it, again, this, this was an older camera and not as good a quality, and, and in low light situations, they didn't take great photos, but watch it, here it comes. So that's uh, a gray vario nest and a scrub jay poking around in it, and I think yeah, there it is. Sorry, I know it's not pretty, but there you go. Um, yeah, and that was an unfortunate reality. Um, but uh, fortunately, uh, many animals did fledge. I, I don't think we have time, but I could read off what the percentages were, but uh, the nest failures were very, very, very high, um, and very few animals survived, um, unfortunately. And that produced a, a, a really cool paper. So, uh, last few slides here. Um, some of the challenges uh, are trigger speed. So the trigger speeds have gotten better. You can buy these cameras down to a quarter second per million now. Uh, previously, it was one and a half seconds, and you might get the tip of a tail in, in your photo. Um, uh, and, but now it's, uh, it's much, much better. And they're getting cheaper and cheaper by the year. Uh, wind, as we talked about with uh, the plants, if you set a motion camera on this, <laughs> you would get only plants moving and maybe a few animals. Um, the background light is super, super important. So the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the other challenge is, is the manual image evaluation. So we're getting to a point where we're doing this uh, artificial intelligence where, where you just run it through a computer filter and it tells you what you have and then they set those photos aside. Uh, it's still, it still has a ways to go. It's getting better. Um, but right now, we're still doing a lot of manual play. Um, and how do you store all these bazillions of photos? Um, we, we all struggle with that. And how you analyze the data um, and the variation detective, uh, detection rates and theft. Theft is huge, huge. I've had probably 50 cameras stolen in my last 25, 30 years. It's just, it's just a given, but we're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, so, um, that's a rabbit head. Um, this is kind of a guide, uh, like a beginner's guide to how to set up a camera. Uh, and I highly encourage you do this in your backyard. You can do it if you live in the middle of the city, you're gonna get some cool stuff. Um, or if you live on a canyon or have some na native vegetation, you'll get cool stuff over time. But you have to figure out uh, uh, what you're trying to do. So figure out your goals first. What, what are you trying to do? An inventory? Do you wanna look at behavior? Or if you're looking at wildlife movement? Everything that we've talked about tonight. Uh, choose your camera. There's tons of different types. Uh, email me if you want my recommendations. There's some really expensive ones and really good that last many years. But then I've learned that these disposable ones, you get three, four good years out of them and you spend 120 bucks and you go on to the next one. That's been working really well for me. Um, uh, consider your surroundings. Uh, always know where you're going to set uh, uh, your cameras, if it's a game trail, if it's a rock, if it's a tree, um, if it's theft, always make sure, uh, and land ownership. You can't do this stuff on Forest Service lands, uh, fish and game lands, anybody's lands. You've got to get permission. So don't set up a camera and think you're, you're, you're legal. Uh, so I highly encourage your backyard first, or if you're, if you're a biologist, you know the rules. Um, yeah, pick your detection zone. Uh, set cameras north and south. East, west, there's, if your camera's pointed east, west, there's a good chance that the glare on, your, on a camera is gonna set off your motion camera. Happens all the time, just the sun will do it. Happens all the time, and you're gonna get a ton of photos of just, of just sun. 
uh, if you put it on a steak. I, I generally don't take steaks because they weigh a lot and you've got to hike them in, so I strap them to trees, bushes, wherever I possibly can. So one of the newest things that we've been using, which I really like, so we have no theft anymore. So most of the motion cameras make these lock boxes. So here's your motion camera. It sits in this box, and then you have a cable lock that goes through it, and you can wrap that around a tree. Highly recommended, super effective, have not had a single theft yet. Know your bait. So whatever your animals are, uh, make sure you have the right bait. Get this book, because it's going to tell you the diet <laughs> of any mammal that you want. But if it's a bird, you know, there's also the bird atlas. Well, they don't talk about diet that much, but uh, know your animals and know uh, what you want. There's, if it's a carnivore, there's one of the lures that you can buy commercially that's really good. It smells horrible. It's called Carmen's Pro Choice. You wear gloves, wear gloves, wear lots of gloves. <laughs> it's, it'll, it'll, it'll change your love life if you're not careful because it'll stay on you for days and it's bad. But it's super effective, super effective. Everybody, what's that? It's online, Just you can find it online. Um, uh, but there's, there's other commercial baits uh, uh, that, that hunters, they're mostly used by hunters, um, but yeah, it's, it's like crushed up in a blender, uh, animal guts and feces and just about everything. Um, and for whatever reason, it worked really well. Uh, and somebody's made a living off of it. I <laughs> wish I thought of it. Um, and then make sure you consider your security. Super, super important. Because uh, it's really discouraging when that $100 plus camera that you just bought is gone one day. Uh, I always write my name and phone number on each camera. Because sometimes people just find them and say, oh, somebody forgot their camera here. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, so I have had people who've done that and, and come home and, and called me and said, I've got your camera and I, I need that one back. So that's all I have. So <laughs> thanks. 805. Perfect. Any questions? Yeah, so the question is, uh, when you use bait, can it affect the distribution of animals? And it's something that, yes, yeah, that we're always, can. there's a bias there that, that you could be drawing in animals that not normally would be in that habitat. So, uh, indeed, yes, that's true. We have not got into that, uh, that realm yet. Yeah, so at some point we do need to, or even iNaturalist is a great, is a great, great platform for sharing those type of data. Uh, why are some color and some black and white? Yeah, so the diurnal photos are often uh, always in color, and at night um, it's just you're just going to get black and white. They won't. Uh, it, it never takes. Uh, it, it tries to, but it never effectively takes good good color anymore. Oh, little guy. Yeah. Are chipmunks related to squirrels? Yes. Uh, chipmunks are uh, in the family Sciuridae, and that's what all the squirrels usually fall into. And so um, they're just smaller little squirrels. And they're really cool. Uh, really, really interesting animals. Very, very diurnal. Uh, very, very easy to see and hear. Your ears are probably still really good that you can hear them. As you get older, we can't hear a lot of the frequencies the, squirrel, uh, the chipmunks uh, chirp at. So. Um, yeah, keep your ears out. Any more? Yeah. There should have. Uh, so the question is, was there legal repercussions to the person who released the, the 30 to 40 pigs um, out near El Capitan? Uh, there should have been, but I'm, I don't think there was. 
And so it was really unfortunate. And then there was another attempt during that, I think, uh, like 2014, by somebody else again trying to bolster what was there, and that person did get in trouble. So um, we were able to, to find who did that. Um, and so I think the word is out well enough now that uh, don't try this again um, or you're going to be res financially responsible. It costs millions and millions of dollars to remove those pins, millions, millions. What about, the, yeah, I'm curious on what's going on with the pot bellies and, and what happened to that person. You know, often these people are just so poor that we can get in trouble for it, but I'm curious of what's going on with that population as well. I, I wish I had an update for you. Wish I had an update. Yeah. 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 You know. Um, yeah. No. Don't. Don't. Don't make me liable. <laughs> um, I. You know. I've had several experiences in my lifetime, and I don't. There's not enough time to tell my outline stories because I've got some fun ones. Um, but. Um, the, the chances of something happening are, are generally pretty low. But yeah, you should worry about pot lines. Always, always keep your guard up when you're hiking in anywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Always be aware when you're hiking. Yeah, so the question is, you know, what about mountain lions? Should we worry about them? Absolutely, but um, just always be aware when you're hiking. Yeah, go ahead, Wayne. <laughs> uh, two questions. I'll, I'll address the first one. Uh, the second one is easy. Uh, let me just do that one. Any porcupines? Not in San Diego, no. Um, not in any of our projects. Uh, uh, that's just a little further north in the southern Sierra Nevada. Um, but uh, the badger question, and um, that might be a good one to talk to Devin. Uh, he runs that program at USGS. But I've been interested in it since the 90s. And so in the 90s, the badger were very, very rare in San Diego. We had very few reports and very, very few roadkill. So like the long-tailed weasel story that I told you, I told people to bring badger to me when they found them as roadkill, and none came. I think one in 15 years. And there were just so few sightings. And then they started turning up at um, Camp Pendleton again, uh, which is just a large open expanse with very few roads. And so you think about San Diego County and how interspersed it is with roads and very fast roads. Um, and so um, uh, we started uh, looking at Camp Pendleton and Camp Pendleton, uh, they just started, we kept getting more and more sightings. I'd get photos, uh, people calling, and then now USGS has like a, a, a website, a reporting website for it. So uh, those data are, are actually really good. Um, but out in East County, so in the deserts, they're still really common. And uh, they, they're very, very um, uh, common in deserts. So we've often seen them doing uh, the surveys we do for a lot of rodents at night. We'll see them just driving um, uh, commonly. But um, uh, out in East County, the roads aren't as fast and they're fewer. And so uh, Warner Valley, if you can think of that big, wide open expanse near Lake Henshaw, uh, badgers love that habitat, and there's lots of ground squirrel that live out there, and there's lots of kangaroo rats that these animals just love to eat, and so the badgers are doing really well out there, and so um, I think the population's rebounding. Uh, there's some, um, and you can correct me on this, or maybe Devin can, about the, uh, they're getting more control on uh, rodenticides, and so there's a lot of uh, impacts of rodenticides and secondary poisoning on badgers. So a badger will find a ground squirrel flopping around on the ground that's eaten some bait. It's not dead yet. Or it may be found dead, and the badger will, will, will eat carrion, and uh, they'll be affected by those rodenticides and, and, and die. And so I think there's a lot more uh, control of that, and hopefully uh, making those illegal at some point in time will really help solve that problem. That's a great question. Go ahead. So the, wild, uh, the, the, the question is, can I speak to, regarding the Bowdoin Canyon Wildlife uh, Movement Study. So uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife has these 
properties that I showed you the map on, and they were um, never fully surveyed. So you, they s and part of their management plan is they've got to have data, and they didn't have any data. Like they just didn't have any information on what existed there and what might be the value of those lands. If the value was high, they may purchase more lands nearby. And so our purpose was to determine if it was a, a valuable wildlife corridor. And I showed you some really fun photos. And it appears, um, you know, without a, not a full um, wildlife corridor study, it appears to be a functional wildlife corridor. And so um, moving animals from that Rancho Globito in the north all the way out to Ramona grassland. So um, it's, a, it's a cool site. And so I, I'm hoping... Uh, uh, this fishing game will purchase more lands nearby as a result. Any more questions over here? Susie. Yeah, so the first question was, why didn't we see any raccoon or bobcat? You did see one raccoon photo, um, but the bobcat, I guess you saw the, the forefoot of a bobcat uh, grabbing, a, grabbing the gray barrier. Uh, we do have a ton of really cool bobcat photos. Um, but her other question was uh, about mountain lion, that you know, if it showed up at her doorstep uh, at a house that Susie has up in Julian, um, would it return? And yes, likely. A lot of these animals, um, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll plug this book that I've, I've heard a little bit about. Um, there's some really cool lion uh, range data that um, UC Davis was working on with some collared mountain lion, and there's some fun maps in here that show how those animals move back and forth, and they'll stay in their territories, and they'll just keep moving around in their territories. Um, one marking them and foraging within them, but there's a really good chance that that mountain lion will come back X days, weeks later uh, on your doorstep. Go ahead up there. I wish. Rancho Guajito is privately owned, and it's, and it's rare to get access, and it's usually, we had access because we had to move crew to get to the upper end of Bowdoin Canyon. And they were really nice about letting us, but it's a working, it's a cattle ranch. And so um, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, it's the lack, oh, the, 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 oh, the winery, yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, apparently, yeah, yeah, the wi they still have a winery right down there off the, the highway. But I think it was a, a last Mexican land grant. Is that is that right? That that a Spanish I'm sorry, a Spanish land grant that um, here in, in San Diego County or Southern California maybe. Yeah, yeah. So it's a full, huge, huge piece of property. Go ahead up there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> now one of the rules. So I didn't show you any photos of. Um, so I, we did show you that one uh, spiny granite uh, lizard that was up there. Um, but we catch reptiles uh, inadvertently all the time in our traps. Um, but there's a new method that, uh, that the herpetologists are using where motion cameras, they'll build a drift fence, and then the motion camera is, set, is straight down on the ground, and it has a, um, a ruler in, in the field of view and so you know how uh, the size of the animal, you have a really good photo of the animal. And so they're using that new method and it's really, really cool and it's relatively new. So um, do I catch much? Yeah, some here and there, but generally not a lot. I'm told I've got to stop because I could keep talking for hours and I really appreciate, you guys are great. You had wonderful questions. Uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>